It is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the Plantation Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Plantation, Florida, and to night number two of our Anchors of Truth series and Anchors Away, Jim Gilly. Yes. And uh, the title is One in the Messiah, and we had a very powerful message from the pastor of this church on last evening. Yes, we did, and uh, we have received messages from as far away as Washington State that uh, where people said that they were blessed by that message last night. It was a good message, and, and I think it set a very good foundation for what we're trying to accomplish and talk about the idea that we need to be one in Christ. And uh, in fact, the emblem of our, our Christianity is unity in Christ Jesus. That's it. And the title of this series is One in Our Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so many times, I think last night, uh, uh, Alex pointed out that he did not realize that Jesus was Jewish yes. until he was reading in the New Testament the first time he read it. Yes. And he saw that Jesus was crying over Jerusalem. Mm. And he thought, what is this Christian doing crying over the Jewish people? Yes. And then he began to realize that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords mm -hmm is himself a Jew. And he sort of threw down a gauntlet, as it were, yeah. having had and associated with so many Christian friends who never really tried to witness to him or to uh, talk to him about, about Christ. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it certainly convicted me that we need to do a better job sometimes in how we portray Jesus, uh, not only to the Jewish community, but to the world in general. But then he saved that by telling us that the one who led him to Jesus did so through his character. Amen. And, uh, and that was a gentleman that his name was Mike Ortiz. And uh, he was uh, ac uh, actually his stepfather. And when he saw Christ in him, mm. then he wanted to know more about Jesus. Yes, yes. Uh, this idea of, of Paul to provoke to jealousy, yeah. that our lives ought to so reflect Christ's life that we make others jealous to want to have what we have in Christ Jesus. Absolutely. Now, tonight's message is going to be brought to us by Jeff Zeremski, mm -hmm. and we saw the title on uh, uh, the intro there, How Bad Are the Jews? Yes, very provocative title. <laughs> it really is. You know, one of the things that, that has really come to mind is that all of the early believers were Jewish. Yes. And it wasn't until uh, Peter received the dream uh, to go and, and uh, uh, to, to be ready mm -hmm. to witness to the Gentiles yes. that it began to open up and open up slowly. So uh, we believe also that it's going to come back. Christianity, the Messiah, the message strongly with the Jewish people. Yes, indeed. This and is a very exciting time and a very exciting and much anticipated anchors. And I'm really anxious to hear tonight's message. And of course, tomorrow night we have Sasha uh, Balatnikov. And absolutely. then on Sabbath, we've got two great speakers again. Now, Jeff Zarimsky is uh, the head of Beth Bethel Congregation uh, in the uh, Newport Ritchie area and also the, the congregation there in St. Petersburg. And I've had the, uh, the great privilege of going to both of those congregations and uh, witnessing there. And it's, it's just really inspiring uh, to go and to take part in that worship. And uh, uh, Jeff and his wife um, have a tremendous ministry. And you know, we heard today about yes. how <laughs> we did an interview today with, that's going to be shown later mm -hmm. on 3ABN. And... Uh, it was an exciting time. And one of the things we found out in that interview was about Jeff's conversion. Yes, yes, yes. And we need a crutch mark. Yeah. Uh, instrumental in that. And uh, she told a little story about Jeff's mom, who was here tonight. Yes. Uh, a really great uh, story and a great history uh, of the van ministry in New York and a number yeah. of people, Jeff, Alan Reinach, others who came oh, to yes. the Lord through that That's ministry. That's right. Yeah. It, it's just amazing how God used that ministry and how... That ministry continues to witness through all of those yes, that yes. came to Jesus yes. during that time. 
Well, listen, before our message this evening, we have some music. Could you tell us about that? It is, uh, the pa- it is coming from the pastor of this church. He is a multi-talented mm-hmm. individual. He preaches. We see him on uh, Back to Our Roots uh, program on 3ABN. But he also, if you watch the program, know that he is uh, quite a singer, sort of a velvet voice and uh, plays the guitar. So we are going to hear from him. Uh, we'll have prayer. Then Pastor Alex will uh, bring us a message in song. And then the next voice we will hear, of course, will be that of our pastor and friend, Jeff Zaremski. All right. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we're just thrilled tonight to come to you You, the great God of the universe, our creator, and our savior. Because through Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that the worlds were formed, Mm. and then Jesus went to the cross. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, Father, tonight we pray that you will bless this service, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I love you, Lord, with all my soul and offer you thanksgiving. You have called me for your It's through you that I live on. Oh, and I will sing your praises once again. I love you.
Amen. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jim and CA. Shalom. I'm going to be asking a few questions as we go along, and so I'd like your participation. It doesn't mean I'm giving you the microphone. Uh, just a yes, no. There's going to be some true and false, multiple choice, a couple things like that. Okay? That was the first question. All right, let's see if we can do a little better on this next question. Okay, let's do question number two. Question number two is, in the history of the Jewish people as a whole, how often have they been bad? Multiple choice. 50% of the time, 65% of the time, or 80% of the time. Okay, how many, we'll do this democratically. How many would say 50% of the time? Is this microphone working? Let's try 65% of the time. I see one, okay, two, three, four, okay. 80% of the time. Okay, the microphone is working. Okay, all right, so that's the rest of the, of the crowd here. Okay, very good. So 80% of the time. Now let's do a run through. Well, I want to ask you a couple of the questions. Uh, first question for this next one, this is going to be a true false. Okay, uh, so you've got a 50, 50, 50 percent chance of getting it right. Um, the Jewish people rejected Jesus. True or false? True? Okay. Number two, Jewish people are rich. True or false? Okay. I missed out on that gene. Uh, so uh, God created me to prove that as false, uh, but he created, I guess, like Michael Bloomberg to prove that as true. Okay, third question. Uh, Jewish people are smart. Yes? Okay. Again, he created me to prove that as false, uh, but he created people like uh, Alex Schlusler and uh, Albert Einstein to prove that as true, right? So we got sometimes yes, sometimes no. Some are rich, some are poor, some are uh, dumb, some are smart, right? Okay, so now we're ready for question number four, which is, uh, the Jews rejected Jesus. True or false? Now, if you notice, that's the same as the first question, but it's really just like the other two, some yes, some no. Okay, so let's do a history to run through the Bible. In the time of Moses, okay, we're going to look at the Jewish people starting at the time of Moses. In the time of Moses, of the 39 years in the wilderness, the Bible records only four times of rebellion. All the rest of the time, uh, of the rebellion, all the other times of being written in the Bible, in that first year, out of hundreds of years of slavery, without a Bible, without the scriptures, all those years without a leader and without any instruction. Uh, and so then Moses comes along, God delivers us, and the first year is very rough, but after that, only four times recorded in the Bible of rebellion in 39 years. Now, I don't think that's too bad. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, how have the last 39 years of your life been? You know, if God's recording that for us all to see. Okay, so we're going to mark that as, uh, as good years. Now, how about the book of Joshua? Now, the Bible specifically tells us in the book of Joshua, it tells us uh, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 29 through 31, Joshua lives about 110 years. And it says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. And so if he lived 110 years, it doesn't tell us how long he, he, he reigned uh, as judge, but if he lived 110 years, let's say he was the same age as Caleb. The Bible tells us that Caleb was 40 years when they went and spied out the land, and so they wandered for 40 years. So let's say he's 80 when he enters into the promised land, and so let's say he then reigns, he lives 110 years for 30 years, and let's say the elders that outlived him lived another 10 years and reigned for another 10 years, right? Okay, that's fair numbers, I think. So let's say 40 years of, of good years. The Bible specifically said that they served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. So those are pretty good years. So now we've got a good book, the book of Judges. How bad during the time of Judges? All right, now we've got some catching up to do here to get to that 80% bad, right? Now, the book of Judges, that's where it says that every man did what was right in his own eyes, you know, this kind of thing. And so let's take a look at what it says. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 8. And it says, The children of Israel served this Cusha somebody or another, uh, for eight years. And when the children of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up Othanel, and the land had rest 40 years. Now what's more, 40 years or eight years? 40. I'll help you with the tough ones, okay? So 40 is longer than eight, right? 
So we have a short period of time of serving this whatever, bad years, and then we have rest for 40 years. Okay, and then uh, verse 12, it says, the, uh, and Israel, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord for 18 years. But then the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up another deliverer, and the land had rest 80 years. What's longer? 80 years or 18 years? 80 years, a lot longer, right? So we got 40 good years, 80 good years, and only eight bad years, and only 18 bad years. And this is in the book of Judges. Okay, then uh, let's see, verse 15. And the children of Israel cried to the Lord, and the Lord, okay, read that. Uh, verse, chapter 4, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord for 20 years. And then Deborah rises up, and the land has rest 40 years. I've seen a lot of 40 in the good years. Children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 1, served Midian seven years. But then Gideon comes along in chapter 8, verse 34, and the land has quietness for 40 years. So the bad years are all short. The good years are all long. Then in chapter 10, verse 2, it says, Tula, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, uh, he judged Israel 23 years and died. And that's all it says about him. It doesn't say if the land had quietness, doesn't say if they served the Lord, doesn't say if they didn't serve the Lord, just that um, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, he judged Israel 20 years and he died. So that's it. So we're going to mark that one as neutral, okay? Not good, not bad, we don't know, you know. I mean, I think you know, if it was bad, the Bible would have told us, but it doesn't say either one. So we're just going to play it safe. We'll mark that one as neutral. Okay, so you're keeping track here. Mark that one as neutral years. Now, could you imagine serving a nation for 23 years? You give your heart and your soul into the work for 23 years, and the only thing that's recorded about you is that you're the grandson of Dodo. <laughs> you know, that's what it says. So that's okay. Now, the book of Judges continues on that way. Uh, throughout the rest with the bad years being very short and the good years being very long. And so the total, if we add in the judges of Eli and Samuel, now they weren't the greatest parents, but, uh, but they, were, they were good judges in serving the Lord. So the bad years and judges in Samuel and uh, with Eli, 111 bad years, 328 good years. Which is more, 328 or 111? almost three times, about three times as long, right? And the neutral, about 70 years, or 70 years on the neutral. That's about 500 years of the time of the judges. That's about the same amount of time of the time of the kings. We kind of have, because there's only one book, you know, in a little bit in, in, uh, in first, and, uh, first Samuel. So we kind of think like, well, you know, go through the time of judges pretty quickly, and then we're just asking for a king all, very, you know, soon after the exodus. But no, it's 500 years, now, that's twice as long as the United States has been around. And most of those years were good years or neutral years. Only about 100 out of those close to 500, over 500 years, were bad in the time of judges. Okay, so let's look at the kings. Okay, we've got Saul. Saul reigns 39 years. I think we'll mark him as neutral. You can mark him however you want, but I think neutral will be safe. David reigns 40 years. The Bible says a man after God's own heart. Solomon reigns 40 years. And we'll play it safe, mark it neutral. He had a good start. He had a good end. He had some trouble in the middle. So we'll just play it safe. We'll mark that neutral. Okay? Uh, and so now from here on, now we're just going to follow. After Solomon, the nation splits, right? And you've got the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. And we're following how bad are the Jewish people, right? So the Jewish people come out of Judah. That's where the term comes from. So we're just going to follow the southern tribes, the Judah tribe, tribe the nation of Judah from here on out. Uh, the northern never had good kings anyway and eventually get uh, lost, the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, so let's follow. So we're going 1 Kings chapter 14. Rehoboam reigned 17 years and did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so now it gets very clear. It tells us very clearly in Kings, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, that they did evil or they did what was right. So we've got 17 bad years. And then in chapter 15, uh, verse 2, uh, Rehoboam's son reigns three years, and he did uh, evil in the sight of the Lord. 
And then verses 10 and 11, it says, Asa reigns over Judah 41 years, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So we have a combined 20 bad years between those two kings after Solomon, and then 41 good years. And then after him, in chapter 22, verse 42, Jehoshaphat reigned 25 years, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. 66 good years between Asa and Jehoshaphat. And Asa and Jehoshaphat are reigning in the south around at the same time that uh, Ahab and Jezebel are in the north. And we've got 66 good solid years of doing what was right in the sight of the Lord after only just 20 bad years. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 17. Uh, and Jerome reigns eight years. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. His son reigns one year, doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And then Atathaliah, uh, the mother of, she kills all her children and grandchildren. She's a daughter of Ahab, but she's reigning over the south in Judah. And, uh, and she reigns only six years. She kills everyone except one. One gets escaped, you know, and he becomes the boy king at eight years old. Uh, and so between those three, it's 15 years, 15 bad years. Eight, one year, and, and just six years. She's bad, and God says, that's it. You get six years, you're out of here. You know, and they, and they have the rebellion against her. And, uh, and so then that uh, young boy, that eight-year-old king, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 12, uh, Jehoash reigns 40 years, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So 66 good years, 15 bad years, then followed by 40 good years. And then his son reigns 29 years, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord, so good years. And then uh, Uzziah reigns 55, chapter 15, verse 1. Uzziah reigns 52 years, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. 52 years. And he doesn't even get a whole chapter in the Bible. He only gets a few verses in, in 2 Kings and a few verses in, in Chronicles, but not even a whole chapter. How many sermons in your life have you ever heard about Isaiah? Probably none. How many, chapter, how many sermons have you heard about Ahab and Jezebel? Too many, right? A lot. Now, why is that? Why, then, is the bad kings getting all the press, and here these good kings get very little? And it's the same like the newspapers today is all it is. Bad news sells. And so the bad news gets written down, and the good news, hey, you're a good king. You know, like the kid in school, he's good. All right, you sit down here. That's, you're fine. Good. You know, forget his name. You know, but the bad kid, he gets all the attention, Right? And so in the Bible, the bad kings are getting all the chapters, all the attention, and the good years are very short. Now, why is that? Why is God spent so much time sending Elijah and Elisha to Ahab and Jezebel and all these miracles and, and, and all this counsel and all his prophecies concerning them? Why is God doing that? Why is he spending so much time on the wicked kings and on nothing on the good kings? Because God loved Ahab and Jezebel. God loved the good kings. He leaves the 99 sheep that are in the fold, and he goes looking and spending all his time for the lost sheep. And so you get all of these miracles and all of these prophecies and all these things being told and, and encouragements to the evil kings so that they'll come to the Lord. And a good king, 52 years, less than a chapter. And then his son reigned 16 years doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Those four kings in a row is close to 140 good years. That's a massive amount of time of good years, 104, almost 140 in a row. And they only get four chapters in the Bible. Not even a full four chapters in the Bible. Or at least in, in 2 Kings, again, they're mentioned in Chronicles too, parallel. And then uh, uh, 
chapter 16, verse, uh, still in 2 Kings, uh, chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, Ahaz comes along, he reigns 16 years, and he's doing evil in the sight of the Lord. So go hundred and close to 140 years and then just 16 bad years. Now, if I told you about a stock, the stock market of stock, that uh, went down 10 times this year, would you think that's a good stock or a bad stock? Bad stock, huh, right? Now, what if I also told you that same stock went up 11 times this year? It's a good stock or bad stock? And what if I told you that for every point it went down when it was going down, it went up four when it was going up? Is that a bad stock or a good stock? That's a good stock, okay? <laughs> that is a good stock. And that's what we're seeing in the Bible. So it seems like, oh, they're always down, they're always down, they're always, but they're really not. And when they're down, they're down just a little bit for a short period of time, and then they're back up, and they're back up for a long period of time. There's just nothing mentioned in the Bible about it. That's all, because it's all good, right? And you think about your conversations. Most of the time, we'll talk about what's bad. You know, how's things going? Oh, good. You know, fine. Not much of a story. But if something bad's going on, you got a story to tell. And that's what the Bible's doing. Then Hezekiah comes along, chapter 18, verse 1. Hezekiah, and he reigns 29 years doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. So we're back on the right track again already. 16 bad after the 100 and close to 140, and now we're back to good years, 29 good years with Hezekiah. Then chapter 21, Manasseh reigns 55 years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Evil, sight of the Lord, 55 years. Now the bad kings... There's no bad king other than Manasseh here who reigns in Judah, who reigns more than 16 or 17 years. I think it's 16 years. There's no good king who reigns less than 16 or 17 years. I get that mixed up. One of them 16, one of them 17. So it's a big difference. All of the bad ones below 16 or 17 and all the good ones above 16 or 17. Except Manasseh. Why does Manasseh get 55, more than any other king, more than any evil king, more than any other king? Why does God give him 55 years? Because God loved him. God loved Manasseh and he wasn't going to let him die. Because Manasseh comes to the Lord at the end of his life. And so in those 55 years, he was serving, he was wicked, he was horrible, one of the worst kings, if not the worst king. And yet God knew he hadn't fully turned his heart over to Satan. There was still some hope there. And God knew that, and God kept working with him, and kept working with him, and kept working with him for 55 years until he comes to the Lord. Otherwise, the evil kings, they don't last long. But he gets to reign in wickedness because he comes to the Lord. And he really shouldn't have even been around because he comes along during the years that Hezekiah prayed for extended life and God gave it to him. I'm going to have a talk with Hezekiah about that when we get to heaven. But uh, you've got to be careful what you pray for. Sometimes it might end up with a Manasseh. Uh, but uh, that's where Manasseh comes along. And then after him, he ends up with a good son, Josiah, and he reigns 31 years doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. So we had again Hezekiah good, Manasseh bad, and then Josiah good. And then uh, verse 23, uh, chapter 23, verse 36, uh, his son comes along and he reigns 11 years doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And his son comes along, Zedekiah, reigning uh, 11 years doing evil in the sight of the Lord. So we have 22 evil years in a row there coming right after Josiah of 31 good years. And then Babylon comes in. So in that last about 50 years, 30 of them were good. And only about 20 of them, 22, were bad. Kind of got this impression, though, that, oh, it was just bad, 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 so God allows Babylon to come in. It was just the last two kings that were bad, according to the Bible, that did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, the good kings, I understand the good kings weren't perfect. There's plenty in the Bible written about what they did bad. And, and even in that chapter about uh, Uzziah, uh, in that less than chapter he gets, what it does say about him is what he did wrong. <laughs> and so even the good kings, yeah, they made some mistakes. And yes, when the good kings were reigning, there were people doing mistakes. I understand that. But also when there were bad kings, there were good stuff going on as well. 
So just going by what the Bible said, did evil in the sight of the Lord or did what was right in the sight of the Lord? So what are our totals during the time of kings? Our totals are of the bad years are 126 bad years, 303 good years, and 79 neutral years. It almost parallels judges. Almost the same amount of years and almost the same percentage of bad years and good years. And again, the good way outweighing the bad throughout kings. And then after that, we have the time of Babylon. We have Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, Azariah. We have Esther. We have Mordecai. We have Nehemiah. We have Ezra. And so we have all these good times. And, and, then, and then we have the 400 years of the time between the Testaments, where there's no prophets. There's no bo books being written in those 400 years. Why isn't there any books written in those 400 years? Why weren't there any prophets during those 400 years? because there was nothing bad going on. Right, we've seen that over and over again. The Bible only sends prophets and miracles when there's bad stuff going on to get their attention and bring them to repentance. But if there's nothing bad going on, he doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't have to show up. He doesn't, I mean, of course he's there, but I mean, he doesn't have to send a prophet to go and rebuke them because that was the job of the prophets. The job of the prophets was to rebuke, to convict of sin, to tell about sin, and to lead people to repentance. During that 400 years, that's the time of the Maccabees. The Hanukkah story is there. And they're serving the Lord. They, they fight against the, the Greek army, the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And they win. And they carve out a little notch of land where they're able to have autonomy. Set up their own coinage and their own leadership. And they're reigning. And they did it so they could serve the Lord. That was their sole reason for rebelling was because they did not have religious freedom anymore. And they fought so they could have it and they risked their lives and gave their lives so they could serve the Lord and worship in the temple and liberate the temple and rededicate the temple. That's what God said. They're doing just fine. I'm just going to let them roll. So how about turn the time of Messiah? How about turn the time of, of uh, Messiah? How, how did the Jewish people do that? Well, in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says 3,000 people came to the Lord. And then in chapter 4, verse 4, it says 5,000 plus women and children. Right? And so Jules Isaac estimates that within three and a half years, about 25,000 Jewish people in and around Jerusalem believed. That's a large number. 25,000 in three and a half years. Does that sound like a people who rejected the Messiah? 25,000 Jewish people accepting the Messiah in three and a half years? Could you imagine this congregation? Let's say we want to do a, uh, an outreach. We're going to plant another congregation nearby here. Let's say we're going to, let's say, whatever, Fort Lauderdale, right? Let's say there's a, let's say there's a, there's a, um, a refugee group there. And let's say they come from a country that doesn't have the Bible, doesn't know the Lord at all. And uh, let's say there's 100,000 people. That's what some people estimate was in uh, Jerusalem in that area at that time. Let's say even 200,000 people. And we go over there for three and a half years. And let's say we, we take 12 of us and we go over there. 12 or 13 or whatever, we go over there. And, and in that time, a couple of us get killed. And, uh, and they try and make laws outlawing us. And we get persecuted there. And, and, uh, but in that time, we baptize 25,000 people. I mean, would that be good? Has this, has this church baptized 25,000 people in the last three and a half years? The whole entire Florida conference doesn't even come close to baptizing 25,000 people in three and a half years. If it did, every other conference would be coming down here to find out what we're doing. That's for the whole conference with a whole lot more than 100,000 or 200,000 people to work with. So that's 25% right, of the people. There's very few countries, if any, that have 25% of the people attending services regularly on, on, on a weekly basis, especially during persecution. How can we say they rejected the Messiah? 25,000 of them, right? Because you've got 5,000, 3,000, that's 8,000 right there, plus women and children, right? So it's easy to just, you know, just triple that for the women and then one child each. You've got 24,000 right there, plus those that were added daily, Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. 
a great company. It increased and multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So we can't even just say, well, it was just the leaders, the leaders, because the leaders, the Levites, it just said the priests, a great company of the priests, a great company of the priests came. And we have Joseph Arimathea, and we have Nicodemus of the Sanhedrin coming and following the Lord. So you can't even say the leadership, because some of the leadership, a great company of the leadership came and joined as well and became believers as well. And then, you know, some people say, and I've had a preacher in a place, and, and, and right afterwards, a person came up to me and said, yeah, but you know, Paul says, I washed my hands of, of you Jews, and now I'm going to the Gentiles. And he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Well, that verse, that quote is in chapter 13. You go just a few verses right after that to chapter 14, verse 1, and it says Paul goes to Iconium, there's a 14 verse 1, Iconium, and a great multitude of Jews came to the faith. So in chapter 13, he worked in that city, and he continued working in that city till everyone had an opportunity to hear the message, and those that heard the message and accepted the message, and the Bible tells us in that city, a great number came there too, and accepted, of Jewish people accepted there also. And then when those who accepted, accepted, and those who didn't accept, didn't accept, he said, okay, now I'm done. I go to the Jew first, and now I go to the Gentile. So I'm done going to the Jew, and now I'm going to the Gentiles. That's what he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. To the Jew first, and then to the Greek. And so that's what he did. He said, okay, I'm done. I gave you the opportunity. I've been here a few years, and I preached to you, and now I'm going to the Greeks. And then he finished there, and then he goes on to the next town, and he does the same thing over again. To the Jew first, and then to the Greek. It wasn't, I've washed my hands forever of you guys, just for that town, because he finished. And then he goes on. He actually does that twice. It's already actually quoted twice in the book of Acts. And also you just read a few more verses. And he goes and it says, a leader of the synagogue comes to the Lord. So Jewish people continuing to come to the Lord through that time. And then in Acts uh, 17, uh, it says that they turned the world upside down. Which world got turned upside down? The Jewish world or the Roman world? It was the Jews that were saying it. What Roman city had 3,000 baptized in a day. What Roman city had 5,000 plus women and children baptized? The Bible doesn't mention any of those. Why not? Certainly if there was a Roman city that 5,000 Gentiles were baptized in a day or 3,000 plus women and children, it would have mentioned it, right? What Jewish city had the whole city come out to a theater and pack it in there and cry out, uh, Diana, God is Diana, great is Diana, great is Diana, great is Diana. It wasn't a Jewish city. It was a Greek Greek city. Or it was the Greeks that were doing that. So yes, the Greeks were coming to the Lord. Yes, the Gentiles were coming to the Lord. But the Jews were coming to the Lord also. All throughout. Jews were accepting it and Jews were rejecting it. Gentiles were accepting it and Gentiles were rejecting it. We get this concept that Acts is all about the Gentiles. And it's not. Again, I believe it. What? You think it was 25% of the Roman world that came to the Lord? I'd be very surprised. This person was not at that time. Maybe later on, again, Caesar uh, got a little upset with it. Now, what about the Bereans? You're familiar with the Bereans? What are the Bereans known for? Being more righteous than the Thessalonica because they studied the word to see for themselves? Well, who were the Bereans? It tells us right there, Acts chapter 17, verse 10. The Bereans in the synagogue of the Jews, and many of them believed. So the Bereans were Jewish that it talks about that we're more noble. And not a few Greeks, right? And so many of the Greeks there too. Now where were those Greeks? In the synagogue. In which synagogue? The synagogue of the Jews. What were the Greeks doing in the synagogue of the Jews? Worshiping the Lord God of the Jews. Now how on earth did they get there? You know, we get this concept, oh, the Jews kept it for themselves. They weren't going and witnessing. Well, if they weren't going and witnessing, what were all those Gentiles doing in their synagogue? And that's in a lot of cities. I only included it in that verse, but it's over and over again throughout Acts. He goes to the synagogue. Many of the Jews come and many of the Greeks that were in the synagogue. So they were uh, converts to Judaism, and they accept as well. Actually, the cities of uh, Antioch and uh, was Jewish. It was a Jewish congregation initially. 
And where they're called Christians, they're called Christians in Antioch. At the time they're called Christians in Antioch, it was only Jews. Paul had not yet began to bring the message to the Gentiles yet. It was only Jews and Gentiles who had been converted to Judaism. In Antioch, the same thing in Ephesus. Ephesus was a Jewish congregation initially. And Corinth too. Corinth was it's in the book of Acts. He went to Corinth and the Jews came, went to the synagogue of the Jews and many Jews believed. And, and many did not. And many Gentiles believed and many did not. But they were all Jewish congregations initially. And they took it to the message to the Gentiles and the Gentiles, you know, then filled up more and outnumbered eventually. Acts chapter 21, it says, and myriads of Jews came to the Lord. That word myriads is, is 10,000. So myriads is tens of thousands coming to the Lord. How can we say that they rejected the Messiah? Or that God replaced them with the church, with the concept of the Gentile church. He didn't replace Israel with the church. He replaced the system, the national system of Jews in the temple and replaced it with Jews. The 12 disciples were Jews. Paul was Jewish. Stephen was Jewish. He replaced them with Jews. And instead of bringing people like the Queen of Sheba to the temple, they were now going out to the world. So there was a, a shift in missiology, but it still continued. God using the Jews to bring it to the world. Not a replacing of it. So what about in the last 2,000 years? How have we done during the last 2,000 years? In the last 2,000 years of Earth's history, we have two groups. We have uh, the Gentiles, uh, that, uh, or the Christians, right, that are bowing down to statues, praying to saints, reading catechisms, breaking the Sabbath, and eating pork. And then we have the Jews, non-believing Jews, worshiping God, praying to God, reading the Bible, keeping the Sabbath, and eating biblically. Where would you go to worship? Those are the only two choices you had, which is basically the only two choices they had. Now, I know there were the Waldensians and others in the mountains and stuff like that, and there was a remnant there. Yeah, I get that, and praise God for them. But, you know, if we're going to say, well, look at the remnants up there, well, then we also got to remember there was a remnant even in Ahab's time, in Jezebel's time, 7,000 who didn't bow the knee to Baal. So it works both ways. Again, there's always been believing Gentiles. There's always been, from the beginning of time, Ruth and, and the Gibeonites and, and, um, and others. So there's always been Gentiles and Jews, but then again, there's always been Jews and Gentiles as well throughout the history of time. And so if during the Dark Ages, a thousand years ago, and, and, and if the Christian church for 1,260 years, the Dark Ages, did evil in the sight of the Lord for 2,000 years, and the Jewish time of that time from Moses to Babylon was 240 bad years out of 1,083 good years. If God rejected the Jewish people, as is commonly taught, for the 200 and something years out of over 1,000, then what should he have done to Christianity for over 1,000 years of bad years out of 2,000? Again, we're going to use that reasoning. That's why he rejected, that's what I've heard. He rejected the Jewish people because they were so bad. But obviously we're seeing that's not the case. This affects our perception of history, how we look at things. And God even prophesied that time period, the Dark Ages, where the Jewish people would still be worshiping, even at risking their lives, when the Bible is outlawed. How, who outlawed the Bible during the Dark Ages? So-called Christians. But they're reading the Bible, they're reading the Torah, but worshiping God, keeping the Sabbath. The Bible prophesied this in Hosea chapter 3, verse 4. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice and without an image. And afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God. So they don't have a sacrifice. So they don't have the, the, uh, the sanctuary service. They don't have a king or a prince, neither earthly leadership or a Messiah prince, but nor do they have an image. They're not worshiping any image either during the Dark Ages. And then it said, and afterwards, they would seek the Lord their God. And, and Verse 5, and afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king 
and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. That's talking about now. So in the last days, so he prophesied. So there's going to be this time period where they're not going to have a king, they're not going to have a Messiah, they're not going to have an image. And then they're going to, afterwards, in the latter days, they're going to seek God and seek David their king. Who's David their king? The Messiah. They're going to seek the Messiah after that time period. Well, we're after that time period. Now is the time for them to hear the gospel. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, it says a similar thing. It says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Least you should be wise in your own opinion. So it's a mystery, we don't want to be ignorant of it, that, you, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So we don't, God doesn't want us to be ignorant of this mystery, it's hard to understand, that, and that we shouldn't be wise in our own opinion, in other words, haughty, lifted up, that we're okay, now we're the ones. That blindness in part not a full blindness. Keeping the Sabbath, keeping the kosher, keeping the Bible, reading the Bible, keeping the scriptures, worshiping the Lord God, creator of the heavens and the earth. But in part, blindness until, I mean, it's going to, that in part blindness is going to end eventually until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Very similar to what Yeshua said. Jesus said, uh, you will see me no more until you say, blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord. And he also says, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And so God's promising that it's going to come back to the Jewish people. That there will be an impart blindness. And then the Gentiles, the message will go to the Gentiles. And when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, when all the Gentiles, when the gospel has gone to all the world, then it comes back to the Jewish people. And they will seek David, their Messiah. But if we've been telling them, oh, the Jews rejected Jesus, the Jews rejected Jesus, you're rejected, you're rejected, they're not going to accept it. And why during the Dark Ages didn't they, why did they have that partial blindness? During the time of Messiah and Paul, they didn't have this partial blindness. Why during the time of the Dark Ages? Well, what was being presented to them? Oh, here's your Messiah. He says to bow down to idols, break the Sabbath, eat pork. He said, that's not the Messiah. Would God condemn them for rejecting that picture of a Messiah? I hope not. So they rejected a false Messiah, waiting for the true Messiah to be revealed to them. And when we reveal him to him, them, they will accept him. That's what the Bible says, because until, and then it comes back to them. Only in part. And this is in the chapter where, where Paul talks about the olive tree. Right? Isn't that the chapter where he says the Jewish branches are broken off? No. That's the chapter where it says some of the branches were broken off. And if only some of the branches were broken off, what does that mean about the rest of the Jewish branches? They stayed on. And it says, and then you, being a wild olive branch, were grafted into them, and then he's able to graft in back those that were broken off. So again, we see the Jews stay in, the Gentiles are grafted in with and together with into the olive tree. And then the Jewish branches brought back in again. Just like Hosea, just like what Paul said. And we go to the Jews, and then we go to the Gentiles, and then we come back to the Jews. Because God is not going to come back until his olive tree is full. Is it within the next verses after that that it says, and then all Israel shall be saved. And so he can't come back until the until we accept that, the Jewish people were not rejected, were not rejecting God, have a right conception of history, a right conception of biblical history, and then we bring it to the Gentiles and bring the Gentiles in, the fullness of the Gentiles in, and then bring it back to the Jewish people. But we've got to bring the right message, the right Messiah, with the right history for them to see it and accept it. And then Romans chapter 11, so... Uh, has God rejected the Jewish people? Romans chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. That's what the Bible says. 
And there's a quote from a book, Great Controversy. And I'll need that on the screen because I, I don't have it written out here. Uh, but from the book, Great Controversy, very interesting uh, quote. It says, concerning, concerning the popular system of misinterpreting the scriptures, the greater part of the Christian church have swerved from a plain sense of scripture and suppose that when they are reading Jews, they must understand Gentiles. And when they are reading Jerusalem, they must understand the church and the going to the mountain of the Lord's house is a grand class meeting of Methodists. That's a misinterpreting of the Bible. That the greater majority of the Christian church is doing, according to that text. And so, for example, if we read um, from uh, Zechariah chapter 8, it says that, uh, and I'll need that on the screen too, uh, Zechariah chapter 8. Yes. Many peoples and strong nations shall come and seek the Lord in Jerusalem, or in the church, if we're misinterpreting the scriptures, and pray before the Lord. And the Lord of hosts says, in the future, ten men of all la languages of the nations will grab the hem of a Gentile man by the hem of his garment and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. And that is the popular teaching. That is how the majority of teaching are misinterpreting the scriptures. That when it says Jew, you say Gentile. When it says Jerusalem, you say church. That Jerusalem has been replaced with the church. That, according again to that book, said that's a misinterpreting of Scripture. So let's read this text again. Let's go back a slide and read it the way it should be, as it is in the Bible. Many people, strong nations, shall come and seek the Lord in Jerusalem and pray before the Lord. The Lord of hosts says, in the future, ten men of all languages of the nations will grab the hold of a Jewish man by the hem of his garment and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. Who is that Jewish man? They're grabbing a hold of the hem of his garment. That's the Messiah. That's Yeshua the Messiah. That's the Gentiles are going to grab all ten nations of all the nations. Grab a hold. He's got to be wearing a talit then for them to be able to do that. He's got to be a Jewish Jesus for them to be able to grab a hold of the hem of his garment. So again, when we change how he looks and how he is, then we're not able to recognize him. We change the Bible. Now, are you familiar with Galileo? Galileo, you know, a nice Jewish boy. He, uh, he was a scientist, and uh, in his day, it was taught that if you had two objects of differing size and differing weight, and you drop them at the same time, that the heavier one would fall first. It's heavier, bigger, whatever, it would go down faster. That was the common teaching in his day. Galileo comes along, and he says, no, 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 no. If you have two different things weighing different amounts, the heavier one and the lighter one will fall at the same exact rate. And they didn't believe him. So he took him to a pizza parlor and went up to the top, with, uh, with a little stone and a big refrigerator. I don't know if it was a refrigerator or what it was, but a big object and a small object. And that's what caused it to lean, right? So you get the leaning tower of Pisa, and he goes up there with these two objects. And he's got some of these other professors up there with him. And he's got other professors down there watching along. And he drops them at the same time. And they land at exactly the same time. These professors, they go, wow. I can't believe that. That's amazing. And then they went back to their classes and they taught the people that if you have two different objects of differing weights, the heavier one will land first. <laughs> they saw it with their own eyes. They were convinced. They believed. But then they went back into their old habit. I think we've seen very plainly here today then the history of the Jewish people, actually, we said, what did you say it was? 80% of the time? That was the majority of what you said? It comes out to 22% of the time that the Jewish people were bad from Moses to Babylon. And then again, we looked at the New Testament, and they weren't bad then either. And then we looked at the Dark Ages in the last 2,000 years of history. And so we've got this conception 
that they were bad, 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 bad. And we read the Bible that way. And part of it goes the way the Bible, again, the, the bad news gets all the press and, and, it, and it says the Jews did this, the Jews persecuted this, but it's was, it was an infighting. Christianity was a, another sect of Judaism. So the persecuting of, by Paul and then of Paul was all just Jews persecuting Jews. It was an infight. So it was the unbelieving Jews attacking the believing Jews is what's going on there. But when we read it sometimes, it, it just looks that way. So our whole mindset has been, our whole perception has been wrong on this. And if we've missed that, and we've looked at texts from, from, from the Torah, we've looked at Judges, we've looked at First Kings, Second Kings, we've looked at the book of Acts, we've looked at Zechariah, we've looked at Romans, we've looked at texts from out throughout the whole Bible. And if we've missed this, that's scattered all throughout the Bible, what else have we been missing? What else have we been getting wrong? And this affects how we do missiology. This affects how we do outreach. This affects how we interact with Jewish people or other people who love the Jewish people. And we're not going to be able to reach them if we continue every... There's no other people group that we talk about every single week at services other than the Jewish people. Right? They're in the Bible, and so we're reading the Bible, and that's what we're talking about. And so we've been talking about them in this wrong way for all this time. Then it affects where we put our money into evangelism. Are we doing it like what Paul said? To Jew first, or, or that, okay, the fullness of the Gentiles, and then when they come in, then again, to be able to close off the work, it's got to come back to the Jewish people. But we've been thinking, well, God rejected them and replaced them with us. Well, then we're not going to have any interest in going back there and reaching them, and then we'll never go home because it's got to come back. That's what Jesus said and Paul said. Then afterward, they would seek David their king. That the blindness would be until that time. And so we need to reach out to them. And so we've had not just a paradigm shift here, bigger than that. I mean, this is a paradollar shift. I mean, it's bigger than a dime. Maybe a para, several dollars of shifting going on here, right? I mean, the total shift from 20 per, 80% bad to really just 20% bad. Total opposite. And the only way that's going to change so we don't go back like, like uh, Galileo's professors there is to allow God to change our heart. See, confession with our mouth takes a moment, but repentance is a lifetime. And it lived out in the life. And that takes conversion. We need to ask God to change us and convert us. So let's pray and ask God to do that right now. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe, as we've seen this here today in your Bible, in your scriptures, Lord, change our hearts and our minds so that we present your word correctly.